my name is Sarah Stankovich and I'm a wildlife technician at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife. For this talk, I'm going to give a brief update on the status of Ohio's bat populations, including changes to the state listed species and what that means for the division's habitat management recommendations. I'm also going to talk briefly about some resources that have been created by the Ohio Bat Working Group and then some ways that you can get involved in the division's bat research. So just a quick background on me. Um, I've been with the Division of Wildlife for a little over two years now. I assist with reviewing um, study plans for external bat surveys, reviewing bat related permits, conducting outreach presentations, but the majority of my work focuses on helping organize and conduct the division's bat research. So this includes our acoustic surveys, our roost counts, our cave surveys, um, all the things that we do in order to monitor the status of bat populations. Unfortunately, there's a number of issues that are negatively impacting bat populations in Ohio. So this presentation is going to focus on our cave bats, and the most pressing issue for them is white nose syndrome. Um, I'm sure that many of you have heard about white nose syndrome, but I'm going to summarize it quickly in case you haven't. Um, white nose syndrome is a disease that is caused by a fungus, Pseudogenerasis destructans, or PD. Uh, the PD fungus is thought to have accidentally been introduced to the United States from Europe. So it was first discovered in New York in 2006, and it's since spread from there. Um, it's now found in 35 U.S. states and seven Canadian provinces. Uh, white nose was first documented in Ohio in the winter of 2011 or 2012. The fungus likes the cold, so it actually grows on the bodies of the bats when they're hibernating. So when they hibernate, their temperature drops, and that fungus can grow right on them. So you see in this picture here that white uh, fungus around the muzzle, on the ear tips, the wing tips, basically anywhere where there's not fur, uh, that fungus can colonize the bats. Uh, the disease mechanisms can be complicated, but essentially what is happening um, is that this fungus is causing an immune response in the bats and it causes irritation. Um, this causes them to wake up from hibernation more often than they, than they normally would during the winter. Um, so they're waking up, uh, they're burning through their stored fat reserves, and then there's not any insects that are really available in the winter for them to feed on, so essentially they end up dying from starvation. As part of our effort to monitor bat populations, we conduct hibernacula surveys. So this means we go into the areas where bats are hibernating or the hibernacula, um, and we simply do a visual count. So there's two large bat hibernacula in Ohio that have been monitored regularly prior to the arrival of white nose syndrome. One of those is in Lawrence County and one is in Preble County. We can look at the numbers from these surveys to get an idea of how white nose syndrome has impacted these populations. So here we have data from those two hibernacula sites for four different species of bats, uh, little brown, Indiana, tricolored, and northern long-eared. The chart on the top is showing data from the Lawrence County site. So this site has been surveyed every two years since 2007. In that second column, you can see the average number of bats from those different species that were present from 2007 to 2011. So that's before white nose arrived in Ohio. And that third column is showing the count numbers from the most recent survey, which was conducted in early 2020. And you can see that this site went from having well over a thousand bats from several different species pre white nose to just having a single bat uh, present in the last count. The second chart on the bottom is showing data from the Preble County site. Um, again, that second column is pre-white nose data. This time the years are 1996 to 2009. Uh, and that third column is the count from the most recent survey, which was completed in 2016. So you can see that several of the species have population declines in this site of over 90%. So we know from the winter data that several species of cave bats are not faring well post-white nose syndrome. We can also look at some summer data. Uh, so these data are from our mobile acoustic surveys that we've been conducting every summer from 2011 to 2020 all across the state. Uh, so I'm not gonna go in depth about all of the methods here, but basically uh, the surveys are conducted by attaching an ultrasonic microphone to the roof of a car and then driving along uh, a pre-established route. So the microphone is plugged into what's called an Anabat acoustic detector. And then this whole setup allows you to record bat echolocation calls. Uh, we can use bat echolocation calls to get a measure of relative abundance. Um, we can't do actual abundance because uh, using this method, you can't tell if it's if it's one bat that's flown by um, five times or if it's five different bats that have flown by once. Um, so we can't do actual abundance, but we can use this for relative abundance. Um, uh, we have a number of routes and they do vary um, a little bit in length and um, it varies uh, depending on the speed, the time uh, taken to drive these routes. So we do take that into account uh, and do a measure of survey effort uh, that helps standardize our data. So here on the y-axis, uh, we have bat detection rate or the number of bats detected per minute per mile. And then the x-axis is year. And um, so you can see that there's a steep decline in detection rate um, right after white nose syndrome arrives. Uh, and overall, there's been a 31% decrease uh, in bat detections from 2011 to 2020. 
We can also look at summer mist net data. Um, so this graph is showing the combined mist net captures of three different species of bats, little browns, tricolored, and northern long-eared bats, um, each year from 2010 to 2018. On the y-axis, we have the percent of total bat captures that these three species represent combined. So uh, for example, in 2010, about 55% of bats captured during the mist net surveys were one of these three species. And you can see um, that as white nose became established, this percentage declines dramatically. So in 2018, captures of these three species made up just around 3% of total mist net captures. And I do want to note that these data don't take into account um, net nights, which is the way that we measure survey effort. So some of the decline might be due to just fewer surveys being conducted in a given year. Um, but if you put these data together with the winter data, the summer acoustic data, as well as um, population trends in other surrounding states, it's clear that these particular species are experiencing serious population declines. This has led to some new listing decisions at the state level. So in July of 2020, the little brown bat and the tricolored bat were added to our state endangered list. And the northern long-eared bat, which was previously listed as state threatened, was upgraded to state endangered, um, and it remains federally threatened. Uh, these bats join the Indiana bat, which has been previously listed as state and federally endangered. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is also currently examining the status of these three species for potential listing, um, and they are currently co conducting a species status assessment. So they solicited both winter and summer data from states, and they're using that um, combined with models to estimate white nose syndrome and wind impacts to predict future population trends. Um, they'll use these models to calculate the probability that these species will go extinct at uh, varying time scales. So the SSA results are expected in spring uh, or summer of 2021. To give you an idea of the timeline for the potential listing of these species, um, the tricolored bat was one that was petitioned for listing by an outside group. So um, there is a 12 month finding due in fall of 2021. The little brown bat is undergoing a discretionary status review, so that is due by the fall of 2023. Um, Northern long-eared bat was previously listed as federally threatened, but this decision was challenged by groups that it believed it should have been listed as um, endangered. So the courts have actually remanded that Fish and Wildlife reevaluate this decision, um, although they did not provide a timeline for um, Fish and Wildlife to complete that. So in the meantime, the Northern long-eared bat will remain a federally threatened species. So let's talk a little bit more about um, the new species that we've added. So first, the little brown bat, Myotis lucifugus. This was the most common Myotis bat in Ohio prior to white nose syndrome. Um, they weigh about seven to nine grams and they have a wingspan of nine to 11 inches. You can see from these photos here, they're fairly nondescript. They have brown fur on their back, a little bit of a lighter tan fur underneath. Um, this bat is very easily confused with the Indiana bat um, and sometimes gets mistaken for the big brown bat with people that don't uh, know the size comparison between them. In the winter, they hibernate in caves, mines, and rock shelters. Uh, they leave hibernation in early April, and their maternity season is from mid-May through August. During the summer, they might roost in buildings, but they'll also use natural roosts like trees with loose bark, uh, crevices, or cavities. The tricolored bat, or Perimyotis subflavus, is one of the smallest bats that we have in Ohio. Their weight ranges from four and a half to eight grams, and their wingspan is about eight to 10 inches. Uh, sometimes when people see them flying at dusk, they can actually mistake them for a large moth. But if you see them up close, they're pretty easy to identify. Um, you can see in the photo in the lower right that they have uh, really pink forearms and a black wing membrane. Uh, their fur is a tan or a reddish color. Actually, each individual hair um, has three different color bands, and that's how they get their common name, tricolored bat. Um, the tricolored bats also hibernate in caves, mines, or rock shelters during the winter. Um, they're actually one of the latest to exit hibernation in the spring, so they'll leave the hibernacula around uh, late April or early May. And their maternity season is from June to August. Uh, because these bats were also common before white nose, um, not a lot of studies have been done to identify their preferred summer roosting habitat, um, and especially not a lot of studies in this area. Uh, but from what we do know, it seems that they prefer, um, rather than roosting in the trunks of trees in those uh, cracks and crevices or behind bark, uh, that we've seen from other bats, they actually prefer to roost in the leaves, um, and especially dead leaves. So you can see uh, in the upper left-hand corner photo here, a photo of two tricolored bats that are roosting in a cluster of dead leaves. Uh, fortunately, the Division of Wildlife got a grant from U.S. Fish and Wildlife to conduct a study on tricolored bat roost tree use, and we'll be uh, starting that this summer. So we hope uh, that we can shed some more light on um, their roost preferences soon. And I also want to cover um, the two previously listed species for people that might not be as familiar with them. 
Um, here we have the northern long-eared bat or Myotis septentrionalis. Uh, this bat weighs about 5 to 9 grams, has a wingspan of 9 to 10 inches. They're also usually pretty easy to identify up close. They have really long ears and a long pointed tragus. Um, the tragus is the structure on the um, inside of your external ear. We have one too. You can see this fairly well in the photo on the, uh, the top right, the really long ear and inside that ear, the really long pointed tragus. Uh, so during the winter, these bats uh, again hibernate inside caves and mines, um, particularly in cracks inside these areas. So they can be difficult to find in the winter. They leave hibernation in mid-March and their maternity season is from mid-June to July. Um, in the summer, they form maternity colonies around 60 to 100 uh, individuals. And they roost more often in the crevices or the cavities in trees rather than under the bark. And they are able to use um, smaller diameter trees than some of the other species. Finally, we have the Indiana bat or Myotis sedalis. Um, this species has been listed as federally endangered since 1967. That's mostly due to disturbance within the hibernacula. So these bats hibernate in really large groups, and unfortunately that makes them really vulnerable to being disturbed while they're hibernating. Um, by protecting the hibernacula, the populations had actually been increasing prior to white nose, but um, unfortunately they're now declining again due to impacts from that disease. So Indiana bats range in weight from five to 10 grams, and their wingspan's about nine to 11 inches. Uh, they're extremely similar in appearance to little brown bats. So that photo in the top left, um, on the left-hand side, that's a little brown bat, and on the right hand side is an Indiana bat. So one of the main ways that you can tell them apart is actually whether or not the bat has a keeled calcar. Um, and that's what's being shown in the right hand side there. That little bump of skin um, on the membrane right underneath the foot is a keeled calcar. And that's present in Indiana bats, but not in little brown bats. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Indiana bats hibernate in large groups in caves and mines, similar to the other species um, during the winter. They'll leave hibernation in uh, April, and their maternity season is from May to August. Uh, in the summer, they'll use dead, uh, dying, or live trees that have exfoliating bark as a maternity roost. Um, so I get asked often um, what types of species of trees that Indiana bats or other bats prefer. Uh, in reality, most bats use a variety of species of trees as long as they have the right characteristics. So it's really more about the form and the function of the roost tree and not necessarily the species. So if it has the cracks, the crevices, the exfoliating bark um, that they like, then it doesn't matter what the species is, um, if that's suitable. So it is true that there are some species like shagbark hickory that are more likely to produce um, you know, that exfoliating bark that the bats like. But in general, um, any of these bats can use any species of tree as long as it's appropriate for a roost. So what do these new listings mean for habitat management recommendations? Um, since northern long-eared bats and the little brown bats are using roosts that are similar to Indiana bats, um, we've been issuing guidelines for Indiana bats for years, and so not a lot has changed in terms of our recommendation for tree cutting. Um, as always, you should avoid cutting or trimming trees between April 1st and September 30th. Um, so when I was giving you the information about the bats, I was telling you their maternity season, and that's part of the reason that we have this restricted um, period during the summer. So if you clear trees uh, during that maternity period, you risk um, destroying a roost tree. So you'd be killing all of those uh, females and all of their young. But even after the young can fly, the bats are going to continue to roost in trees until they either leave um, for their winter hibernation or they migrate. And that usually takes place in October. So that's why that um, restricted period lasts through September. Uh, whenever you are cutting trees, it's best to leave as many potential roost trees as possible. So um, if you're clearing an area and you can leave the dead or the dying trees um, of any size, if you've got trees that have that loose peeling bark, they've got cracks, crevices, uh, cavities, you should leave those if you can. Uh, any large diameter live trees, so something that's um, 20 inches DBH or greater, uh, bats will also use those. So those are great to leave as well. Uh, you can see an example of a roost tree with um, the exfoliating bark in this picture on the right here. So if you're not sure what that looks like, here's an example. Um, we do have a new recommendation in order to avoid impacting tricolored bats. Um, and again, that's that you should avoid um, cutting trees that have large clusters of dead leaves. And those dead leaves are um, mainly going to occur in the upper third of the tree. So if you have a tree that has that characteristic, um, you should avoid cutting that as well to avoid impacting any tricolored bats that might be using it. We do have some new recommendations regarding potential disturbance of hibernacula. Um, before work begins, we recommend completing what we call a desktop-based assessment um, of the project site in order to determine if there are any potential hibernacula nearby. Uh, to complete this desktop-based assessment, we recommend using things like the ODNR Mind Viewer tool, um, topo maps, aerial photos, any other resources that you have um, where you can look for features like caves, mines, 
karst topography or rock shelters uh, that might be serving as potential hibernacula for bats. If you do find these features near the project sites, um, you should follow up with a field visit to determine whether or not they're suitable hibernacula. Um, Fish and Wildlife has some criteria in their Indiana bat survey guidelines um, that can help you evaluate whether or not something is considered a suitable hibernacula. This is really important if you're doing something like subsurface work, so if you're doing mining or boring, or um, especially if you're, you're doing something that is impacting bedrock. Um, if you're developing or impacting something like a cliff or a ledge habitat, and we've been finding that bats are actually using these rocky areas that aren't underground. Uh, and if you're doing any tree clearing that might be near the entrance of a cave. So for all projects, it's really best to coordinate with um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Ohio Field Office and us at the Division of Wildlife. So uh, we can help you provide project specific recommendations. So if there's a reason that you need to cut trees in the summer, uh, for example, we can help you uh, figure out a way to do emergence counts or um, do selective clearing in order to help you avoid potential impacts to these listed bats. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears uh, and talk about the Ohio Bat Working Group now. So the Ohio Bat Working Group uh, works to facilitate communication, information sharing, and collaboration between people with an interest in bats throughout Ohio. So our group um, is made up of researchers, agency staff, uh, consultants, rehabbers, educators, uh, and more. We always welcome new members, so um, I'm going to provide some information in a later slide about how you can connect with us if you're interested uh, in joining the working group. Um, in 2018, the Bat Working Group published a uh, bat conservation plan for Ohio. So this plan lays out uh, different short and long-term goals uh, in three different areas. So education and outreach, research and monitoring, and habitat management. Um, and we recently formed some subcommittees around these groups, uh, and each, uh, each of those groups has been working towards accomplishing the goals that are laid out in the plan. For those of you who are interested in managing your property with bats in mind, um, one of the products that the Bat Working Group has created is a brochure titled Managing Habitat for Bats. Um, so in this brochure, you'll find information for improvements that you can do at small scales. So things like installing a bat house or planting uh, native plants to attract insects uh, to larger scales. So maintaining those roost trees um, or protecting any hibernacula that you may have on your property. Um, if you'd like hard copies of this guide, you can send me an email, which I'll um, post at the end of the presentation, and I'd be happy to mail some to you. And I'll also tell you in a little bit um, where you can download the PDF version if that's suitable for you. So if you're interested in keeping up to date on bat-related news uh, in Ohio, finding resources, um, or joining our working group, there's several ways that you can connect with us. Um, we have a listserv, so we'll send out announcements, updates, and job postings through that listserv. And the Bat Working Group also has a Facebook page and a website. So the links to all three of those um, resources are at the top of this slide. Uh, on our website, you can find a lot of different things. We, we created a series of um, educational videos for Bat Week um, on a variety of different topics. So those are available under, under the uh, Bat Week tab. We have links to um, what to do if you have bats in your house, uh, how to build bat boxes. If you are a teacher, there's some links to um, bat-related curriculum. So we have a lot of really good stuff on there. Um, if you click on that habitat management uh, link, then you're going to uh, get a list of things. And the top one is the PDF version of that uh, habitat management guide. So that's an easy way to find that. And then there's a lot of really good uh, resources on that tab for landowners. So I recommend checking out this website if you are looking for some bat related information. Um, hopefully we have it there for you. We're always working on new content. So if there's something um, you know, a link that you'd like to see on there that isn't there, please provide it to us. If there's um, some type of resources like a, a field guide or a bat house fact sheet or something that, that you would like us to work on and that would be helpful to you, uh, feel free to suggest that to us and we'll see what we can do. Uh, and we also are having a virtual annual meeting on January 28th. So depending on when you're watching this presentation, uh, you might be able to join in on that if you're interested. There should be some information um, under that annual meeting tab on our website. And finally, I'd just like to wrap up by plugging our community science projects in case you are interested in contributing to the division's bat research. Um, we have two projects. The first one is a bat roost monitoring project. Um, this one's really easy for anyone to participate in. Um, basically, you just find a bat roost. So if you've got bats in your barn, if you know of a park nearby where there's um, a bat house, any of those kind of things work. And you count the number of bats that exit the roost. I um, mean, do this two times, once during the spring and once in the summer. So. It really only takes about five hours total between those two uh, counts. If you're interested in doing that, um, the protocol and the data sheets are on that Ohio Bat Working Group website under the Get Involved tab, um, or you can contact me and I'm happy to provide you the information. 
Uh, and then the second project, as I mentioned earlier, we do a um, statewide mobile acoustic survey. Um, and that's done largely with the help of volunteers for the last 10 years. So we're revamping this program in 2021. We are going to um, change the protocol a little bit to join uh, what's called the North American Bat Monitoring Network. Um, this is a um, continent-wide effort to try to standardize the way that we are doing bat research in order to allow us to look at trends um, at larger scales. So get everybody doing um, the same protocol so that we can compare that data and it's more powerful. So we're gonna be joining that network in um, 2021. So there's lots of opportunities for new people to get involved in those um, mobile acoustic surveys. So if you're interested in that, um, please send me an email and I'd happy to um, provide you with more information about that. So here is my contact information if you'd like to reach out to me. Um, I'm currently working from home, so I don't have a phone number here. Um, email is really the best way to get a hold of me at this time. So if you're interested in any of those community science projects or you have um, questions or concerns about any bat related topics, I'm really always happy to chat bats with anybody. So again, um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thank you so much for watching.